Good morning, all. Can can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, Great, thank you. I can't see. We've got 130 on. Um, I think uh, we've, we've got around 170 registered. I'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, let you all get settled in for <laughs> what's going to be a whirlwind tour. Hello there. 
Just a quick question. Will the slide deck be shared later on? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, okay. and we're recording the session as well, and it will be made available on uh, on our YouTube channel. Okay. We'll be circulating it in the newsletters. All right, thanks. Okay, I think we're at three minutes past ten. We've got nearly 150 people in the session. Um, I will. Shall we make a start? Hang on, I just need to make sure I can read my own screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Simon Harrison. I'm the uh, a design assurance lead uh, on the half hourly program. Uh, this session this morning is the second one of our playback sessions and uh, is intended for um, uh, participants who are newer to the program or who are looking for a, a bit of a refresh on the, the high level design um, and the artifacts. So it's quite, a, I'm intending this to be a bit of a, a straightforward walk through of where we've come from and where we are uh, and how you guys have engaged or can engaged. Um, if I move on to, can you see the slides moving? Just looking for a quick thumbs up from somebody. Yes. We had a problem. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Um, and so to so the approach to the session uh, as approach for all the uh, the playback sessions is that is that we're trying to um, get as everybody as close as possible to a level playing field to engage with the design before it goes for sign off at the key milestone at the end of October. So this is about um, informing people in different degrees, and I'll come on to it later in the session, uh, on the elements of the design um, and some of the decisions that have been made. Uh, we are trying to signpost for new participants or those that do need some, some overall support. Uh, and this particular session, as I said, it looks at the overall design um and we'll give you a, an indication on on which future sessions might be of interest for you to attend um the outcomes there you should have a better view of the the um the mhhs uh, design uh, the services uh what we mean by the tom the artifacts what they look like how you can then um pick up and review these um the slide pack, as we've mentioned, will be shared pretty imminently on the collaboration base, uh, and the recording will be on YouTube uh, quite quick after the meeting. We are we have turned the chat off in the meeting, uh, mainly to uh, stop me being distracted as I go through. But uh, Marina's on hand uh, to uh, federate any comments that get raised on Slido. Uh, the Slido uh, box is on the bottom of most pages, so. Um, we will get to the end of the, the session, hopefully. I, I'm a pretty fast talker. We've got uh, until 11.30, and uh, we will look at uh, trying to resolve as many of the Slido questions that you raise as we go through. Uh, we don't intend to get into too much detail today, um, uh, and we will pick up uh, and share the outputs of the Slido, again, on the collaboration, collaboration base later. Uh, this all helps us then inform future sessions. So we're intending to repeat this session in September for the people that haven't been able to cover the August um, date, um, but we would certainly take feedback onto areas that might need a little more detail. So what intending to cover today, uh, a quick uh, view of the program objectives and outcomes, a look at how the market is designed today, because that then uh, helps explain the changes that are being made. Uh, the target operating model that the program has designed uh, uh, solutions for, uh, which covers the services, the, the data integration platform, um, and then some illustrations of the target operating model in context. And then um, how to access the design, where you can find the artifacts, what they look and feel like, um, uh, and then some of the other sort of help elements that, that are available to you, the glossary and the, the design tooling, which is going to be quite is pending access. Um, and then just a, a quick look at the, the, the further playback sessions that might be of interest. And as I said, a, a quick uh, review of the, the slide or comments that you've been raising as we go through. So um, headline outcomes of the uh, market-wide half hourly settlement program. And this is a, a slide I think that, that we cut in, in December or something else. I don't think anything's really changed. Uh, the intention is for improving accuracy of settlement to make uh, the, uh, to change the settlement timetable so that the, the dates are brought in from 14 months to around about four months. Um, it's a big enabler. Um, if you've been privy to the, uh, the, 
the, the replan discussions. You, you may have seen the video from uh, our Ofgem sponsor about uh, how much um, they need uh, our program to be successful and timely in order to uh, support wider policy objectives around net zero, which you know will support the, it, could, it will be a building blocks for uh, more flexible and independent innovative energy system and uh, the I think the headline business case has got and it's not 1.6 pounds it's 1.6 billion to 4.6 billion um, uh, in the uh, the off gem impact assessment and then the technical changes that, that the program um, is delivering or assuring uh, because um, we will be integrating changes made by other programs and other um, uh, participants such as, as the DCC or, or Electron's Project Helix. Um, and there are four new Electron systems and services. We're amending um, nine existing systems. We're implementing a new underlying event-driven architecture. I will explain what that means. Uh, there will be changes to multiple industry codes and their supporting systems and helping participants understand how to interact with the new systems and evaluate the impact of their own uh, solutions and processes. So um, this might be a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, but uh, it's useful as a, as a way to, to get us started. Uh, the current model, this is drawn from Alexon's website on the, uh, the half hourly program, uh, that this is the scope of their operations and the red circle highlights the scope of the program. Uh, so we're not changing everything inside of, of Alexon, it's just the elements uh, that were put in place back in the 90s to cope with the uh, the way that the market had been designed then with the split between the larger consuming sites having their consumption uh, tracked on a half hourly base and the bulk of the sites in residential and, and commercial properties um, where the data was collected by uh, typically a meter reader, uh, which you know is, is a dying art. But uh, it, it, because of the relative scarcity of consumption information at that point in time, a whole series of services calculations were created in order to provide a similar, le similar level of granularity for the non-half hourly sites as for the half hourly sites to enable the, um, the wholesale settlement of uh, electricity consumption and uh, so the change that, that we are making is that the scarcity of consumption information falls away with the availability of smart meters um, and therefore we are able to take a, a rather robust review of the existing design and uh, recommend some changes. So uh, the, the market as it stands at the moment operates under a supply hub principle uh, where the electricity supplier um, will have a contractual relationship with a meter operator who uh, goes out and uh, you know installs, maintains, fixes meters. Uh, they, they will have a relationship with a data collector who will have been a, a meter reader or operated some kind of automated meter reading service in the past. Um, there is a registration service that uh, provides the mass data for all of the, the meter points and the relevant metering data, how the meters are configured. And then uh, there was some standards, there is some standard software um, of, provided by Alexon to aggregate the consumption information to feed it into uh, the half hourly process that I described earlier on. So yeah, there's a couple of purple arrows there for people that would actually interact with uh, meters in properties. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's green arrows to show how the information flows uh, and uh, a blue arrow to show where the, um, the energy supplier has got a contract in place to deliver those services. It's worth bearing in mind that that's, that's the current setup. The, the supplier is responsible for delivery of those services. There are some changes as a result of the program to that model, and I'll come back to that after we've been through a little bit more discussion. Um, and then the other thing that, that, that the, the program is changing um, that's quite fundamental is at the moment, uh, information is exchanged in the electricity industry using the data transfer network um, on a, it's a kind of a hub and spoke network. I'm sure I get pulled up on that one, but effectively, uh, if you want to send um, an appointment to a data collector as an energy supplier, you create a message using the data transfer catalog um, and drop it onto the network with address information and it gets delivered to the um, addressee. Um, and there are over 200 participants that, that engage and, and, and exchange messages across this network at the moment. But this is um, pretty much how the, the, the system has been operating for over 20 years. Um, and um, one of the concerns with moving from um, a non-half hourly basis where we were lucky if we got 
two or three reads in a 14-month settlement window to one where we're expecting 48 advances every day for nearly 30 million sites. Uh, the view was it was possibly time to review um, how the message exchange uh, uh, in the industry worked. And so again, I'll explain uh, the proposals around what we are doing with message interchange shortly. So um, a, a short background on what the program has done to date to uh, uh, develop the design that I'm going to talk you through uh, across the rest of the, this, this session. Um, so before uh, the program uh, was created in September last year, uh, there had been a series of industry working groups, the design working group, kicked off in 2017, looked at different target operating model options, made some recommendations, looked at transition, everything else that like, produced and consulted upon um, a, a number of, of options around this. Uh, two groups followed from the design working group, there was one looking at code change and development, as in, you know, how were the industry codes affected by the proposals of the target operating model? Um, and then there was an architecture working group looking at technically how could we resolve the challenges um, and the opportunities that moving to a half hourly, market-wide half hourly basis would present. So uh, those three groups provided the platform that then the program picked up to then produce the design that, that will be uh, more or less issued completely to you, you guys on, on Monday. Um, we've had um, over 100 uh, working groups so far um, at various levels of engagement and, and expertise. You'll see the numbers on the slide. As I say, you'll get the deck. I'm not going to read all this out to you. Um, we have to date uh, issued uh, approximately half of the, the design artifacts. The balance will be made available on Monday, uh, but that's been done over the past few months um, to, to I don't know, to smooth the the workload inside inside of the program and also the review workload for participants um, and to uh, move everything through the program governance. I will again come on to what the program governance for design approval is quite shortly. But there's been an awful lot of work and an awful lot of support, uh, both inside the program and from all the participants that have both attended the working group and raised those, as you see, over 2,000 comments against the artifacts that have been produced so far. And so the, the way that the, um, the the process has been working at the moment is that there will be subgroup meetings on registration, on metering, on specific settlement activities or reports. Uh, the, the, the team will uh, draft a, a design artifact. It will be published on the collaboration space. Um, we will anticipate uh, the, you know, comments coming in, uh, issues being raised. Um, those will inform the update of the artifacts that are then pushed into the governance of the program, which is uh, that there are level four meetings. Um, uh, and I, the next couple of slides explain what those are. And then up to the level three, which is called the design advisory group, which has um, is on a constituency based model. Um, you will have a representative, large supplier, medium supplier, small supplier, independent agent, network operator, uh, those uh, along that model, which is the same for the other level three uh, and level two groups inside of the program. Um, and the DAG has sign off on the design artifacts. Um, what has happened is the, the, the red line there shows how participants have engaged, they've attended the working groups, they're able to access and review and provide comments against the artifacts as they're raised, um, they'll receive the feedback against these, they have attended the level four working groups, um, uh, and you know that they, they will be supporting the rep in the constituencies uh, as they attend the DAG. Um, uh, this the sort of the, 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 the right hand side of, of this flow um, will be taking place um, across September and October to get to an agreed baseline. Um, and so, you know, it, this isn't history. This is still uh, occurring. Uh, there was, uh, I think, one of the final subgroups. There was a meeting yesterday and there was one earlier this week. But the artifacts should all be resolved um, for issue on Monday. And then I think I've got one more build on this slide, which just shows how the program um, is assuring that design. Um, you'll see the green line there, which is myself and my team. We join those subgroup meetings. We review review the artifacts as they come out. We document some findings uh, from a quality perspective. We um, we are assessing the design against um, best practice such as TOGAF and the BA Book of Knowledge. 
things like that. We are modeling it in a tool, which again, I will show a short view of that. Um, and then we will be publishing findings and recommendations um, to support the uh, the approval of the baseline in October. And then towards the, the left side, you've got a big plot purple wrap for the independent program assurer, uh, which is a, a service being delivered by Pricewaterhouse for Offgem on behalf of the program, who are a third line of assurance support to make sure that, that um, participants' voices are being heard, that uh, Offgem's uh, requirements are being met, um, and that both the, uh, the, the assurance team and the design work stream are, are acting in accordance to make sure that we are covering the TOM um, and acting upon comments um, and having good governance in how we deliver the design. And then uh, just the groups that, that have um, that have been taking place, as I said, the DAG is there at level three. Uh, in the, so the blue is the design area. Uh, I'll come to the green and the purple. Uh, there's been a business process requirements working group uh, where everybody could attend. There's a technical design working group for the, the, the architects and the technical SMEs. And there's been uh, a number of meetings of the security design working group, which is for the, 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 the cyber groups. And then under the, the, the BPRWG, you'll see there's been a whole host of, uh, it's been a, a moving feast of different subgroups that have, uh, the program has been fairly fluid and agile in responding to where uh, more discussion or challenges need to to respond to this. So we, there's been um, specific groups looking at, uh, at the Alexon services and then the, the reports to be produced by the central services. Um, the, the registration subgroup has had specific sessions on, on cost transfer reads, et cetera. The other group that's called out there is the Consequential Change Impact Assessment Group, which isn't um, as such a formal design group. It is a uh, an opportunity for suppliers and the program um, and networks and other participants to to um, apprise each other of the implications of the design as it has emerged. Um, it's met once um, and, and worked through uh, a, a number of items that were raised by uh, a couple of participants. Um, and this is about um, where the design explicitly is intended to resolve the target operating model for settlement, but has uh, a consequence on other processes beyond uh, settlement, which could be, it could be billing, it could be metering, it could be whatever, but th this is an opportunity for uh, participants to raise uh, concerns around, you know, the consequences of the design beyond settlement. Um, the green area uh, just explains the testing and migration advisory group, which again is a level three with the constituency reps. Uh, they've, they're establishing a, a bunch of working groups. Uh, the environments uh, group met earlier this week. There will be groups around migration and, and uh, qualification, things like that. And then there's the code change advisory group, which is almost the, the follow on from the code change uh, development group um, that, that was a precursor to the program, which is where the, the program engages with um, uh, the code delivery bodies, SECAS, um, Electrolink for Dacuza, Akusk, et cetera. Um, uh, because once we've agreed as an industry what the design looks like, uh, those guys will be picking up their red pencils and making changes to the regulatory codes. And so the code drafting working group has started as well. So those, those are, there, there will be other groups as the, the program is, is relatively fluid and reactive and responds to, to needs as, as we see it. There is a governance framework document that reflects where we are with these things. It's all available on our collaboration space. Um, what I'd like to cover now is, is the target operating model. So effectively the design for, for market-wide half-hourly uh, settlement. Um, this is the design that was passed to the program by uh, the design working group uh, and, and those groups that came before uh, and agreed by Ofgem as the, 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 the correct way forward following consultation to make a uh, half hourly settlement operate. You'll see there that, that, that again, we've got, um, there's some color coding that you'll see throughout the rest of the deck. We've got orange for areas uh, under the LDSO means uh, network. Uh, distribution network, or, or how you use it. The, the blue areas uh, sit with supplier responsibility, um, and you'll see there that, that again, settlement shorthand is is a, the balancing responsible party when you see BRP. Uh, I will again point you to the uh, program glossary and acronym finder towards the end of the deck, and then the green stuff across the bottom is is Alexon itself um, and the changes there. So these are the new services that will be set up for the top. It does exist a bit in 
isolation from the rest of the industry. You'll see there's there's nothing there to say, well, where does supplier connect? Where does, you know, where's the data integration platform uh, and things like this. But again, I will come on and explain uh, those things shortly. Um, uh, this is a slide I did right back at the start of the program, just to provide a bit of context around that, Tom, uh, to highlight where the new services sat and, uh, you know, who you could expect to perform them um, and the different um domains of meter types or unmetered types effectively that that, that that were included so um but then the numbers on suppliers might have changed a little bit in supplier agents uh but the industry is the size of the industry the, the um the metering service smart up there and the the, the sort of the column for smart meters covers pretty much you know 95 percent of of the uh of the installed uh metering base in the country um the advanced uh the, leg covers just less than a million uh, typically business sites and then you've got the unmetered area which is you know around about six million street lights car parks uh, charge points those kinds of things um, and, but the program has recognized that there are uh, different needs for each of those uh, metering populations and the services have been defined in a way to um, to distinguish those so again th th this is a build on the tom and what i'll do now is uh, talk to you all about um, what each of those services mean. So the metering service is smart and metering service advanced is what we would understand to be the meter operators things stand. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to read every every part of the slide out to you, but um, these are the guys with the, ba the vans and the spanners that will, will fit the electricity meters um, and go out in case of a fault. Um, so they've got a key role to play in, you know, in the installation, maintenance and configuration uh, of the meters. Um, and but the impact upon them from a sort of a business perspective is relatively minimal. Uh, half hourly assessment isn't really changing things uh, for, for the MOPs um, or the metering service providers, as we should say now. Um, but they will need um, to uh, change the way that they interface um, for some of their activities. Uh, it might be that for smart meters, they will need to use a, a, a DIP interface rather than the uh, D149150 to change, uh, to provide uh, meter technical details. Um, the next area that we can cover is the smart data service, which is a little more complicated because it's a wrapper placed around three new services. And I'm waving my fingers in the air when I say new. Uh, meter data retrieval service. This is a, a, a new service that will exist inside of a, of a um, metering service provider. Previously, you could have imagined the smart data service to have been what you would have called the non-half hourly data collector. On the half hourly data collector, it's that kind of agent role. Uh, the correct use of language inside of the program is for this to be a data service provider. Um, and as you say, so the, the, the metering data retrieval is a capability to, and it's a, a change to the DCC systems to allow um, a, a new party to set a schedule for the meters to provide half hourly information. Um, and so it will do this upon instruction from the processing service, which is down at the bottom, which is the one that holds all the MPANs that, that are relevant uh, for the suppliers appointed by this particular smart data service provider to go and collect data for. So basically the, um, the MDR um, sets the schedules in the smart meters for the information to be pushed into the smart data service. Uh, where we have um, non-smart meters, uh, and uh, traditional meters or whatever you want to call them, or smart meters that are experiencing communication difficulties, there is a meter reading service. So that's, that's a fallback to uh, the physical collection of data from premises um, to collect the, the register reads, uh, or if there's an AMR that's non-smart, but you know it's a reliable communication, again, that can pick up data from there. And the processing service at the bottom is effectively um, the data collector used to be a, a case of there'd be data retrieval and data processing. This is the, the build and the data processing. So um, it will take all of the consumption information collected by the two services above um, and process it to a point um, using um, the methodologies and, and um, other processes to make sure that the, the data is fit for purpose to be provided to the central settlement services towards the bottom of the page. So uh, 
smart data service, uh, if you're reading across the old world, would have been your your data collector, and it does uh, encompass both the sort of the retrieval and processing. Um, what is removed as a result of having half hourly data for every site is the need for a data aggregator. So there's there's no service for data aggregation uh, in the TOM um, because data aggregation exists existed to um, uh, collate the information into relevant profiles um, to uh, as a facsimile uh, for what half hourly would have looked like. We don't need that when we've actually got half hourly data for the vast majority of sites on a daily basis. Um, the advanced data service does something similar, um, but it effectively it will do the collection and processing with the there's advanced systems. Uh, this is where we've got a dedicated line or an existing um, half hourly solution. So uh, again, similar to uh, the smart data service, this is this would have been your half hourly DC um, picking up uh, and continuing their service. Again, not a huge change as with the the, the mops. Not a huge change to how these they would operate in the market with the with the with their sites there will be some changes to how things are validated estimated processed and again uh, there will be changes to how they um, engage with settlement and the rest of the market over the dip rather than the dtn um picking up on on the unmetered area uh, again not significant changes uh, in in this area the the um so uh, is a is a role delivered uh, by the distribution networks um, and it's an inventory management piece that it does with local authorities and, and network rail and so, so forth um, that will continue as is the the, the rather the mouthful of the umstus um, again it, it picks up um, and does a, some forms a similar role uh, to the other data services but it, it's rather than working with consumption information it uses the the metadata available inside of where is it the 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 bsc software known as equivalent meter just to say well how long were the street lights on in this area and uh, what kind of wattage do they operate against and those kinds of things so that the consumption information for unmetered supplies uh, are provided in in a way that can be consumed by the electron services towards along the page and speaking of the Alexon services, um, and there is nothing with the registration services here. There's nothing. We're not changing specifically how MPAS MPRS operates uh, functionally. There will be changes to the interfaces and um, you know, some of the business processes it interacts with. But there's no new capabilities inside the registration services as such. Um, it, it's more there's a change in the in the. Uh, the, the messages it receives and is required to then uh, publish as well. But for Alexon, and this was the first page where you see it, there were three. Uh, when we got the original Tom, there were three services. But as we've gone through the design process, we discovered and decided that, that we needed to create a new service, the, the industry standing data, um, which is at the bottom there. But that, that was previously a subset of the, the volume allocation service. So the market-wide data service is the one that, that, that collects all of the settlement period data that the, the, the data services will have sent to it um, and then this is where the aggregation takes place um, uh, and produces the, the consumption information that then goes into the, the, the big belly of, of, of Alexon to deal with the, uh, the central data collection agent and, and, and create um, uh, the bills for the generators, the suppliers, the networks, everything else like that. The load shaping service is um, a new service created to take the consumption information and uh, support the data processing services uh, where there could be gaps in consumption information. Uh, so uh, whereas previously we, we would have had uh, annualized advances and EACs and profiles and, and all these kinds of things, the load shaping service is the, um, the change that's being made um, to recognize the fact that we will have quite a lot of data and that uh, that data will recognize and we need to bear in mind that you know uh, we're not building just for today in in 10 15 years time we might all have evs and, and different um, flexible needs that uh, both import and export on the um on the electricity system and therefore um, grouping us all into you know a fairly simple and blunt profile class isn't really going to cut the mustard. So the load shaping service will take account of this in creating profiles that then the processing services will use to fill in the gaps and support the estimation and validation. Um, and then the volume allocation service is, is well, it, it links to the market-wide data service, collects all that information and the information from the grid supply 
point from the central data collection agent and then passes this one through um, to get into you know, central settlement. Industry standing data is, is, is the final sort of new service and this is an uplift build change on the, uh, the market domain data uh, that currently uh, Alexon makes available over the DTN or as an alpha download via an Excel sheet. And so the, 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 the program has discussed which data items are relevant, what kind of cadence do we need for those, and um, that's what this service addresses. So therefore, if we go through uh, and consider the results of, of those new services, you'll see that the Supply Hub changes after the, the, the program, the, there is no data aggregator anymore. There is uh, a much reduced need for the data service provider to physically interact with meters. Um, but there will still be a need um, for the supplier to have contracts in place with a meter service provider and a data service provider in order to meet their um, settlement obligations. Now, I'm going to try and um, <laughs> explain what an event-driven architecture is, because this is what um, the program has been asked to deliver by Ofgem after the work of the architecture working group. Um, when I showed you uh, the, the hub and spoke diagram for the DTN earlier on, um, that's a fairly rigid serial um, sort of synchronous way of exchanging information. What an event-driven architecture is, and this is used by many modern technologies handling uh, millions of data points and multiple multiple participants uh, you know uh, with very low latency on a regular basis and effectively and i'll show you some context for this later but it, it's 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 a more loosely coupled approach to this uh, you know the 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 um in the data transfer network, you do have this concept of acknowledgements and non-acknowledgements, acts and knacks, and you know then the sender was responsible for ensuring that the 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 receiver had had received the envelope, everything else like that. We move away from that basis. There's still uh, the the event producer will publish information and will receive confirmation that it has been published correctly, but it doesn't need to wait for confirmation that the recipient has read it and understood it. Um, and so it, the event producer here will publish information, the, there's a broker in the middle, which is what the, the, the data integration platform will support to sort this into who can access the information uh, you know, what kind of uh, message pattern does it need to go across. And then you've got event consumers. So that could be Alexon suppliers networks that would subscribe to the best basic topics. So that's, that's a high level view of what an event driven architecture is. And a very specific model of this would be um, how we would get consumption information from a smart meter to central settlement. Um, so yeah, the, the, the smart meter, the DCC, um, the, the information will be collected by the meter data retriever that I explained earlier on into the smart data service, who would then publish uh, onto the DIP um, a, a daily file of half hourly consumption data, um, settlement period level data, I think actually using the, the, and then the parties that could consume this, this would be the market-wide data service, it could also be the supplier themselves, it could be the distribution network, would subscribe to say, well, yes, I'm interested in that information. The data integration platform will be able to validate that that, that is a um, uh, an authenticate, that the supplier is the right supplier for the right M pound on the right date, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, uh, this information, the, um, the smart data service has to publish once, um, and then you know it doesn't need to be too concerned that the, the, the various subscribers have actually picked up the information uh, their responsibility ends uh, uh, basically ensuring that the publication <laughs> and the data is correct things like that so effectively this is how um, uh, we are implementing an event-driven architecture not particularly sophisticated implementation of this um, uh, the, things get far more complicated for interesting use cases such as Uber but um, this is um, the first use case of the data integration platform as an event-driven architecture. Things could get far more complex if you had to build intelligence in there around pricing signals and EV charging units, et cetera, which all could exist in the future of the DIP. But at the moment, we are, we are using the, uh, the DIP as a message interchange. Um, no business logic exists inside of the platform. It basically is a pipe um, that uses some rules to move data from publishers to subscribers. Now, I'm going to show a rather more complicated slide that those of you that have been engaged with the program will have seen before. Um, this is the TOM, the off-gem TOM, as I showed you before, with all the new services, but I've added in 
the data integration platform, the purple block in the model. There's a, a brown block in the top left for the smart DCC and the various services they provide. Uh, I've broken out the distribution and registration services. Um, and then there's a supplier box sort of bottom left showing all the different ways that suppliers could configure and interact with the service. Um, all the blue lines are the new interfaces that the, the program is introducing. Um, uh, they're typically themed along, you know, there's meter details, there's industry standard data, there's consumption information, etc. And the black lines are the existing interfaces between those actors that the program is not changing. Um, and the, the pink blob in the middle, um, it, which is why this is called the Patrick diagram, shows the scope of the program. You know, it, it's, there are areas where um, the program will be changing things. It's not changing metering. Uh, it doesn't go too deep into the way that suppliers on networks operate their businesses. Um, but the reason it's called Patrick is because one of my colleagues thinks it looks like a character from uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. And yeah, unfortunately, that's stuck. So uh, if you hear people talk about the Patrick diagram, this is what they're talking about. Um, and this is an evolving picture. I think we're more or less done. Uh, I made a change over the past couple of weeks to add in the dark blue box because there have been discussions in the working groups about how do we get the electricity inquiry service updated at a reasonable cadence, given that the, the registration services will be updated rather more dynamically than at, than at, at the moment. So the, there's a little bit of optionality around there. But again, this is the Patrick diagram. Uh, and this is a visual language that we tend to use to, to try and help people understand the TOM and the new services being introduced by the program. And I'll, I'll talk you through in the next few slides how, how we use this kind of uh, visual to, to help explain uh, the changes, uh, the design, et cetera. And um, so here we go, here's an, an illustration. This isn't, this is using the same kind of layout, but this is the market today. There's none of the new uh, market-wide services on there. This is how we operate our market today. Now, an energy supplier might have multiple relationships, uh, on a regional basis or on a, a meter type basis with data collectors or, or data aggregators or meter operators or whatever it would be. Just trying to illustrate here in the, in the, in the boxes that aren't filled that those are the existing um, MOP and DC relationships that, that uh, suppliers have. And the pink is the DTN. This is how people you know, uh, interact and engage uh, with the DTN. That by no means is that showing all of the sort of 200 plus data flows that the DTN does. It's just a, an illustration for context. So this is the market as is. And once we get through um, systems integration testing and we move into qualification, the new services will be available for uh, suppliers uh, and other service providers to operate as we migrate the MPANs in. And that then leads us to a model that looks like this, which is slightly more complicated. We've added the DIP and the interfaces there and the solid boxes in the, in the blue and orange there show the new service provider roles that have been added um, and the interfaces to the DCC and, and other areas um, using either blue lines there, you will see uh, their non-DIP activities. So. Uh, you'll notice that the smart data services talks to the data service provider at the DCC, but it does that using a DCC service request rather than a DIP message. Um, and equally, the interchanges with CSS um, and uh, the the way that um, uh, some of the operations inside of suppliers uh, and distributors, um, they remain uh, as is. With the, those activities are not moving onto the dip. But during um, cutover and migration of the sites from the old world to the new world, uh, we'll be in a period of transition where both systems will coexist, um, which does get, add a, a degree of complexity. But uh, there are, as I say, there are groups at the moment looking at migration and the approach to migration. Um, at the the design of how migration and transition will work will be picked up by the design work stream after uh, the design has been agreed in, in October. Um, uh, there's already thought in there, and it's a, it's a very informed piece, but in order to get the, uh, the, the design for the enduring state agreed and baselined and for people to be able to start doing their development work, uh, the view was that we needed to uh, get that out and agreed, and then we would uh, move on to uh, doing the low-level design on, on transition and migration. And then just, just to show, you know, um, post uh, the, once the program's done and the migrations are completed, uh, uh, this is the simple version of the, the, the Patrick or the Tom. Um, what it, again, there's no electricity 
inquiry service on here because these are slightly older slides, but it just show that the, the DTN remains. Um, there will be, and I haven't necessarily got it, but the metering service smart, where it's working on traditional meters, will still need to tend meter technical details using the, the, the DTN flows um, to, to suppliers and to, to other participants, things like that. So there's a retained capability in the DTN. The, the DIP doesn't entirely replace the, D, the, the DTN for um, because the scope of, of the, the program is settlement. Uh, the DTN is used for you know um, many other uh, business processes and activities across the industry. Um, we are replacing uh, the settlement activities and uh, that's the sort of the initial work that will move on to the DIP. It will fall to the industry to decide what it does with that retained DTN capability and as and when and if it moves other um, activities to the dip uh, once it's up and running and then i've got a, a quick illustration of a, of a simpler version here this is this rather than all the blue lines black lines everything else like this was a, a request from the test working group just to show how do we think that consumption information will flow um you know so the, the, this picture shows that it's the consumption is generated in in smart meters advanced meters or wherever and will will be collected either by the dcc or um, over the wires for advanced or by a you know a field visit with a handheld terminal um uh, for the for the non-smart meters and then there's some element of choice here as to how the consumption information is then passed to suppliers suppliers can get through a dcc uh, SR, as can the networks, um, as suppliers could cho then choose to um, uh, was the circumnavigate the need for, for an MDR and just provide that information directly to whoever is looking after their processing service. They may well be doing it themselves if they own their own supply business, uh, agent service provider business, not supply business, service provider business, or if um, there's uh, an independent agent, they could, they could also offer a subset of the smart uh, data services. There's, there are options in the blue boxes for how suppliers could choose to configure these things. The crucial part is that the submission of consumption data for use in settlement has to come from the processing services themselves. Uh, that's where it will be picked up by the market-wide data service. And yeah, so the consumption information is published by the data services onto the DIP, and then you know people that are subscribing to it, suppliers, networks, and certainly central settlements. Uh, will uh, will pick those things up. But again, this is an illustration of, of how the design um, and how, you know a, a journey could be illustrated using the, the the visual language that we've got. And then I think I've got a final one here, which is earlier in the year, and you can see how much earlier it is because you know the the, 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 the Patrick is a lot simpler, and it's just a hexagon there. Um, uh, myself and the design lead, we 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 sat down with each of the constituencies and explained uh, our view of where the risk sat, um, or you know the, the the most impact would would be for different constituencies. So this is the supplier version. There were versions for networks, uh, service providers, DCC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the the key areas that we've highlighted here is that the, moving away from the the DC DA model is going to be quite a significant risk for suppliers um you know but uh, changes to registration service and advanced data services felt like less um less of an impact and certainly the changes into settlement services for suppliers would be uh again this is all relative uh, not as uh, extreme as, as the changes that need to be made in order to ensure that there's a, a compliant and continuous uh, provision of information to settlement. Uh, so that's why we need the smart data services uh, to be robust. The, the, the changes to settlement services itself um, should be effectively pretty much a black box to suppliers. There will be changes to market domain data and other reporting um, and to some of the, the timing and some of the performance measures. But functionally, it's not any, a significant change for suppliers. Um, if I move on now to how people can access the design, uh, this is just a quick sort of walkthrough. So all of the, the interesting information I've shown you on, on the, the, the services and the TOM and the event-driven architecture, everything else like that, is all captured in a series of design artifacts. Um, and that's how I've been able to construct those kinds of pictures and uh, everybody else has got sort of a view of what the service would look like. Um, and so the design artifacts are available on our program collaboration base. If you don't have access, you can request access from uh, the PMO. 
um, it is, it's a relatively straightforward. It's a SharePoint site, um, but we do restrict access to uh, to this in, to make sure that, that we operate uh, sort of securely and and, and 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 we're able to track who is accessing it and things like that. So um, there is a specific subsection of the collaboration base. Uh, that deals with design and the design artifacts it's a very simple area to navigate um all of the artifacts as of monday will be on there this, these are screenshots i took yesterday um and just i just want to sort of signpost some key con sort of content on there for you um there is a link on that that's a, it's a quick link on that page that shows you the artifact tracker which will show you all of the artifacts there's around 80 of them uh, by type by state, by readiness, whether they've been approved or not. And that artifact tracker also has tabs that will give you a view of the design issues that have been raised and discussed and the state that we have against those, uh, any design dependencies that have been identified. There's a tab for dissensus where the program has um, been through a discussion of a particular subject and agreed to disagree and documented where things sit with those. Uh, there's some view of the design risks. There are high level design principles that are used by the DAG um, in the approval of the design artifacts. And then there are severity definitions for the issues that have been raised, which with the design is a little unusual, but it does mirror the sort of test, SEV1, SEV2, SEV3, SEV4 type process, because if we've got any extant SEV1, SEV2s, when we get to trying to approve the design, then clearly we need to address those because they will be seen as showstoppers. So the artifact tracker is a, is a very interesting artifact. It's a live view of where the design work stream is. It's updated daily. Um, and so it's a good lens into not just the artifacts, but also um, if you've got a, a concern or a query or an issue, it's probably worth reviewing the design issues and the dissensus log uh, to see if this has been considered by the workstream um, be, before raising a comment when you would just get pointed back to those logs anyway. Um, uh, then uh, a recent addition to the to the collaboration space is the, is the artifact matrix. Um, if you were part of the session on Monday. This is about signposting which artifacts are most relevant to individual constituencies, which are broken down suppliers, agents, it's called in there, but those are the service providers, the, the, the networks, independent networks, DCC and Alexon. So for each of those sort of um, the, the groups of business processes and related artifacts, you'll be able to see which ones you know are highlighted as being of interest if you need to direct your attention or the the attention of your resource to specific areas to understand. I mean, 80 artifacts is quite a, quite a big pile to go at, but actually, you know, the, the, there is a way of, of uh, prioritizing these to ensure that you, you get the focus on the right areas. And then, yeah, this is an extract from Monday's deck, which again uh, is available on YouTube and on the collaboration space. This shows the business processes in that, that Tom language again, a yellow box equals a business process and where it is. And then uh, the little blue dots say, yeah, this is of interest to a supplier. So some of the ones in settlement are not necessarily of interest to suppliers and the DCC one isn't that important for suppliers to review, but there's certainly, you know, quite a few for suppliers that, that need to have a look at. And now I'm going to show you uh, what each of the artifact types would look like. So um, a business process diagram, there's 22 of these and it's exactly as you'd expect. These are, these are big swim lane illustrations uh, of how the processes would work through. Um, there are references across the top to related artifacts. Each of the swim lanes across uh, will have activities and each business process diagram has a connected business process description where each of the steps has a description it highlights which interfaces are, are included you know who sends them who receives them those kinds of things and it provides the traceability so these uh, the, the business process diagrams and descriptions come as a pair um uh, you know this is a pdf this is an excel sheet those kinds of things but th this gives you a view of those, those key business processes that are being proposed by the program we've also got for some of the newer services and for some of the specific actors and organizations, there are business requirement specifications. We are working against these, but this is, you know, the, the could, should, would, you know, the approach to these things and the requirements. And again, it provides a traceability against which business process, which interface is affected, et cetera. So again, as you'd expect, there aren't business requirements across the program, but for the, the new processes, this is where we sit. 
there are further artifacts that I will come to that you know highlight where there are non-functional requirements and technical specifications, things like that. I think actually that's my next slide. So yeah, there are other artifacts, and I'll show you the interface catalog shortly. There's a reporting catalog as well. This you know it provides a low-level detail of um, how to engage with the DIP and also what reports will be produced by Central Settlement. And then there are method statements which look like regulatory documents but they explain how to do validation estimation how to do calculations how to do load shaping things like that so there are a number of method statements where there's lower level of detail um, uh, on how to operate the new services there will be a, a, a document um, called operational choreography which is about the timing of, uh, of how the processes interact there, there will be a logical data model and again we can show you a sort of a, a quick extract of that shortly and then there's the technical artifacts the uh, the dip functional specification and non-functional requirements have informed the procurement process which is ongoing at the moment to to uh, procure the dip um, there's an end-to-end -end technical architecture and non-functional requirements and then there's a physical interface specification as well that sits with the dip and then we've got a, a cluster of security documents and architecture requirements and then a, a code of connection um, these are available but I think they're in a, um, a secure area so access to them you need to request specifically over and above access to the collaboration space should you want to review those documents. Um, again, all of these documents have been through the working groups so the technical ones and security ones have been through the very specific working groups and the, 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 the experts in that space um, in order to, to get to where they are. And then uh, I've got a couple of pages here of, uh, of information on the, uh, on the interface catalog. So this is a list of the different interfaces um what's the interface called which processes it sit with you know who does it go to and from etc um and then an illustration of what an individual interface looks like so this calls out um uh, a detail for one of the rows on the previous slide and each one of these has got an illustration of how you would then construct the message the json message that would be what you would um push or receive from the api that is how people will interact with the dip and then uh, finally here's a sort of a, a quick look at, at the data item catalog that sits underneath the interface catalog etc and so this data item catalog will be provided on monday um, and then work will go ahead with the design work stream and my team to produce a, a logical data model uh, so that everybody can can operate a, in in a more modeled <laughs> way to understand the data so those are the interfaces um, and the different artifacts uh, that will be available for review. Most of them are there at the moment. Um, there's, uh, the, the balance will be made available on Monday. Um, uh, for the, the complete new starters or for people that are getting a bit lost, on the collaboration base, uh, one along from the design area, there's a help center. And that's where we've got a glossary. Um, there's a link here that will work in the slides. The glossary is quite straightforward. Uh, it's been available for a while. It consolidates all of the defined terms um, from the different documents. You can click through on a letter and get to each one of these. And then if you click on one of those individuals, you'll get the definition that's been listed and has been used by the program. Um, and there's a cross-reference in here to other codes, because clearly if you start using uh, terms like meter or settlement, then uh, there will be views across, uh, you know, the, these are the five codes that are affected by the, 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 the market-wide half-hourly program, uh, BSC, Kursk, Takuza, Rec, and Sec. Um, there are tags in the glossary to, to highlight where those are in, included. And then um, uh, the, the final pieces, and this, this is a bit of a, a jam tomorrow one, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, my team has created, uh, uh, is assuring the design using some design tools. So an enterprise architecture tool and a, and a requirements tool. So this is how we are, uh, trying to um, assure the coverage of the TOM and the services and the consistency of the design being produced. As I say, we've been party to the discussions and we've supported it, but our role as assurers is to make sure that the quality is there uh, and that, 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 that we are able to highlight inconsistencies. And so there is an enterprise architecture repository which will shortly be available by the collaboration space. It was due to be August. It might now have moved slightly to the uh, to the right as, as we get all the content loaded in. But this will allow you to uh, drill down from a business, application, organization, technology perspective to understand the different services and capabilities everything else it takes all the content on the Patrick and all of those artifacts and models it in a way that uh, an architect would, would recognize. And then we will we'll have a, a requirements repository as well. 
So uh, this is a little snippet from the dashboard to show that at the moment we've got 393 requirements in there that we, we're making progress against uh, quality assuring these against uh, things like traceability, testability, verifiability, all those kinds of things to ensure that, that when you uh, all start to do your own develop and build work, you can operate against a clear set of requirements as drawn from those artifacts. And this will then support the, the future work of the program once we move into the testing phase, because these requirements will then drive the test cases, scenarios, etc. And so that's my sort of walkthrough of the design and how you can access the artifacts, everything else like that. Um, from here, uh, we can move forward and look at what the rest of the playback is going to cover. Uh, we had the kickoff in the signposting session on Tuesday. Uh, we are at this quick design overview uh, introduction session. On Monday, there's going to be uh, an introduction by the design work stream themselves to you know the basics of the dip, how we're approaching testing, uh, the outline of um, of the design is a bit lower level than what I've got, and it's being presented by uh, some, some serious program SMEs. Um, and then uh, the, the, uh, on the Friday next week, I think there's a meter bank meter to bank session, which follows the flow of the information from collecting it from the meters and then passing it through to um, a central settlement. Uh, and then the week after, and we have had to stagger this because of resource availability across the summer. Then we get into MPAN ownership, which is around change of supplier, registrations, uh, service provider appointments, things like that. So all the things to do with appointing and managing suppliers, service providers, etc., uh, in the uh, in the program context. And then uh, the, the the final session in the week after is around uh, change of meter change of segment, energization status, those kinds of things, the physical context of the meter and how it's being moved. Um, at the same time um, as we're performing those sessions, there will be a technical deep dive. So that's an opportunity to, to, to um, hear from the solution architect on the dip and what does the JSON mean, what are the APIs, what are the swaggers, all of that kind of technical detail at a much lower level. There's a session on how we're dealing with unmetered. There's going to be one on settlement and the new reports and the services around understanding data, those kinds of areas. And then we will have one on advanced meters as well. Um, and then there's an opportunity in the darker purple for um, people to have um, uh, multilateral set discussions with the sort of the lead SMEs from the program in technology registration settlement metering wherever it would be and the approach to these is we will be opening up Slido before each of these sessions for people to log questions so they'll be able to say well you know I've been going through the design I've got a bit of a concern around this uh, settlement report and that would then give the SMEs some time to prepare an answer. Uh, uh, questions will be taken in the meeting. The, these sessions will be tightly facilitated. But we, what we want to try and do is, is cover as much ground as possible and cover as many questions as possible. So we might be uh, putting a time limit of five or 10 minutes on, on debating each of the topics as we go through this. Um, and then as we get through the end of August and into September, we'll have a bit of a retrospective on, on how things have gone, which areas um, and themes are emerging through the feedback we're getting through Slido, and also from your emails, which I know are coming into the, to my colleagues on the PPC, um, and anything we pick up at the open day on the, on the 6th of September. And we'll say, right, well, there's a couple more weeks here. Um, we're going to be very resource constrained for the SMEs, but myself, my team, and some of the PPCs, we might be able to uh, then help uh, set up further sessions uh, where people need more help. But yeah, the, the view is we're going to get through most of the playback in uh, in in August um, uh, and make it all available for reading and video viewing and everything else like that. But we, we need to do this. We need to get our um, our design experts free and clear to start dealing with the comments you'll all be raising against the design once the comment window is open, formally open um, in September. Actually, uh, the comment windows are open from Monday. You can raise comments and the, 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 the team will see them for that point. And there is a deck available on the collaboration space that guides you through how to raise comments, which logs to use, um, et cetera. Um, I did have one more here, which was just a bit of a quick signposting to say, well, which persona do I have? You know, I'm new or I'm an expert or anything else. Like, which session should I attend? And I'll let you read that one at your leisure. But I think after an hour of me burning through that at speed, that's the end of all the points that I wanted to cover. Uh, this morning, um, Marina, are we do we have some interesting yes. points on Slido? We do, Simon. Thank you for that um, brilliant overview of design. That was really helpful. 
Uh, we do have some questions coming through. Uh, a couple I can answer right now. So just quickly, where can we see the breakdown of the 1.6 to 4.6 billion pound benefit? Uh, that is in the off-gem business case, uh, which I've replied to on Slido, but we'll also include that in the FAQs. Um, and one question about the collaboration base. Um, will we can we, how do we have access to the collaboration base? Um, please get in touch with the PPC team, um, PPC at mhhsprogram.co.uk. Uh, we will uh, take your access request and go from there. Um, and then if we just move on to, oh, it is, is it possible for the PDF documents on the program collaboration base to be um, produced without track changes on? Uh, we will be producing both clean versions and with track changes for you to access on the collaboration base and the website. Um, we've got a couple, Simon, for you around the dip. Um, one is uh, looking at the um, the DIP's K PKI service. I believe that's public key infrastructure service. When will we have yep. confirmation of that? Uh, so uh, we are resolving um, which service provider for the dip that we'll move forward with the procurement is due to conclude october november and then um the, each of them has got a different approach to what the key management whether or not they're using the ones embedded in in amazon or in azure or repurposing the existing dcct scheme so once we get closer to i think the bafo is due to conclude at the end of august and we move forward we'll be able to find a bit more clarity in there but each one of these would be um an existing service that that you probably um, have uh, connections with, but the definition will be resolved. I would have thought um, at the end of the year, um, around that point, possibly a lot sooner, uh, depending on you know who falls in and who falls out of the process. Fab, thank you very much. That's helpful. Um, will the DIP take over all half-hourly data feeds from the data transfer network? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the one half hourly data feeds. Yes, where for all settlement information, uh, we should be moving everything across the dip. Um, that, that's the, there are some nuances around the traditional meters, um, and, and the meter details there, but for consumption information, it should all be collected and processed through the new services, which need to use the dip. Thank you. Um, another one around the DIP. When can we expect more technical data about connecting to the DIP? Sync versus async responses, API, info, etc. Does this information already exist and where can it be found? Yes, it does. And it will be in the um, in the interface documentation that's published on Monday. Lovely. Um, so the, there are there are some areas there already. The, the technical design working group have been discussing things such as making the Swagger documentation available. Um, but yeah, the the the, the interface definition uh, the, there is a an artifact I think called physical interface specification. That's where you'll find that kind of data. Fab, thank you. Um, and one that has been upvoted by three people. Uh, it's more a sort of comment concerning that changes to third party service providers connecting to the dip are being touted as not a huge change. Um, yeah, Paul, it, it, I think that's just my language. If, if you're a mop, um, it would be a significant change. I appreciate that to change, uh, you know, away from the DTN to the dip. That's that's a big technical change. But um, half hourly settlement as a program is not changing the way that meter operators operate. Um, and you, the, the impact to data service providers is clearly far more significant. And that's what I was trying to get across. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, how long are the legacy systems anticipated to run post live? Um, so completion of migration should mean that, that legacy systems can fall away. It's not a decision for the program, but more a decision for the BSC panel as to whether or not the program has delivered that outcome of accurate settlement uh, on the new settlement timetable. So um, reports um, and monitors around um, running both settlement timetables at the same time before we can cut over and close the old one off will dictate when some services can be deprecated. Uh, it's there is a, a an element of this in the replan, but it does sit off quite some some way in the distance. So I uh, can't answer that one specifically. We could probably try and find you an answer uh, if there's if there's detail of that in, in the replan. 
Uh, thank you. And and just going back to the uh, previous response about the half half hourly data flows, um, does that mean that the D zero two seven fives will be replaced by new flows via the dip? <laughs> one <for> you. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to take that one away. I don't know unless unless one of my colleagues is on that can answer that one definitively. Yeah, we'll 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 go and speak to one of the the, the guys about that. That's. Fair enough. I think we will come back. And just to note, um, alongside putting the slides and the recording up on the collaboration base on the website, we will also be we're also collecting all of these questions and putting them into a larger FAQ for you to go back and read through. Um, will we be provided with a list of all the data flows that will be removed? I believe so. Yeah, I, this is I think that that information exists. It's not again. So the design that's that, that's available from Monday it is the new world um but the, the the impact and implications of that i think i've seen a, a list of the it's it's been a moving feast um and there's been in and out there's been some debate around specific data flows um but that again information will be available uh, thank you and kind of in a similar vein is there a view of current um current interfaces mapped to new ones and with a note of which are being discontinued so similar Again, let's, let's, yeah. we can pick that one up, yeah. Fab. Um, speaking of Monday, what is the difference between this session around the design overview and the session on Monday, which is the end-to-end -end walkthrough design introduction? Yeah, I've been I've been speaking to Claire, who's who's doing the slides for this one on, on Monday. You might see some replay here. Mine was a very high-level overview of, of both the context, the artifacts, everything else. Like Monday should be a, a low level about the components of the design itself. So it's got dip basics. It's got um, it, you know how the program has gone about um, arriving at the designs it, it's arrived at. I've skipped through quite a lot myself. There will there will be a lot more detail on Monday, and if that's more appropriate for you as an audience, then uh, by all means, sign up and, and join that session here. Uh, Justin and Kevin walking you through in, in some detail there. Fab. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, we are definitely encouraging sort of the BAs and tech and design leads to join the end to end walkthroughs in particular. Thank yes. you. Uh, why does the program use the term registration service and not ERDA? I believe that's electricity retail data agent to be consistent with the retail energy code. <laughs> because we sit across <laughs> five codes and so yeah that's it's one of the things that's that's been a little bit challenging in the the settlement views of distribution network as an LDSO uh, and uh, the, the ERDA as MPRS uh, but uh, you know other systems call it MPAS we've we've tried to to be as balanced in describing things um, as what they do rather than using the, the, the four letter acronyms prevalent across the industry, wherever possible. Thanks. If that makes sense. Yes, so re know. registration rather than the system title itself under whatever code is relevant. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, and one around uh, half hourly meters in the TOM. Where do traditional half hourly meters exist in the TOM? For example, large industrial sites with dedicated half hourly meters um, dialed by DC. Do these fall under smart or advanced? They should sit under advanced. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any estimations around NFRs, uh, non-functional requirements, e.g. volumes or actors? For example, how many messages will be generated or consumed by a supplier per meter and then impact on data volumes, etc.? Yes, the, the, the NFRs have been uh, discussed and debated and, you know, they, they are included in both the DIP and the end-to-end. Uh, NFR artifacts so uh, that's been discussed at the technical design working group quite significantly um but the, the, a view and it might be a view at a sort of a holistic homogenous level rather than down at a specific sort of participant level but th that's how we've got to the sizing and scoping of the capacity needed in the system fab thank you um what references are made to the uh m past the metering point administration service are we talking specifically about smrs are we expecting changes to the erda or only the smrs <laughs> smrs <laughs> well yeah this is similar to the point earlier on about the erd and everything so that registration service is there. there there will be changes um that impact the st clement's service and also the cnc service that is produced that supports um um the the, the electricity 
inquiry service uh, but they've been party to our discussions so yes that registration service box on on the tom um however we badge it is um impacted here um in the fact that some of the messages will move from being dtn to dip and some of the data items will be changed and some of the business processes and timings will be changed uh, thank you um only a few more to go, so I'll stop firing questions at you soon. Um, the smart data service, are they qualifying as an other user under DCC to access smart meter read data? Is this still expected to be from the supplier to the data service? Uh, so uh, the MDR is a will will be a new role under the, the, the relevant uh, SEC mod um, and expected to um, accede to the SEC um, in order to access the DCC services, I think you're using the right language there. But yes, yeah, so the smart data services where they will be, uh, where they need to, and if they're not an existing uh, SEC user, will need to become a SEC user in order to be able to become a DCC user uh, and access the data from the smart meters. Fab, thank you. And um, this is one more around customer consent. So not sure if it's necessarily one for uh, right now but propose consent change uh, residential customers to opt out explicitly of half hourly data for settlement how is it handled and processed with mdr how is it that's a, de that's a detailed one we we'll probably have to take away, take I think, away. Yeah. Yeah, that, happy to do that we'll, we'll do that and, and put it in the faqs um how will one know when an mpan has migrated to mhhs to half hourly it's a good question. Um, <laughs> again, <laughs> one to be answered later, I think. That's fine. Um, yeah, there, there is um, there are considerations. The, 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 we were past uh, a design that had a, a one way gate, so that an MPAM once it had moved to half hourly uh, was in half hourly forever, and so that would make it. Um, there are, as there is at the moment, where you've got a market segment indicator, there would be something similar. But uh, we've been asked to consider the option of more flexibility in the migration of MPANs um, back and forth between uh, the new world and the old world. And so that might then determine how we resolve. And this is, this is the point I made earlier on about the migration design being done post-October. Um, yeah. uh, we have uh, there's, there's, there's a team working on this at the moment, and we should have more clarity on that once we get through there. Fab, thank you. And um, one around, uh, will we have access to the Ezio DevOps site? Um, uh, it's still to be resolved. If not access, then certainly um, we will make the information available via the collaboration space. So again, it's something something for us to consider because Azure DevOps is how we will be administering testing and testing issues, test cases, that kind of thing. So it would make sense, um, in my opinion, for some participants to be able to have access to that one. But equally, we might be resolving that through a lens such as the collaboration space. Um, so it might not be direct access, but certainly access to the requirements repository, for instance, you'll have a view into the different requirements and the traceability and, and things that we've got in there. Um, but uh, yeah, you just need to resolve whether or not it's it's what kind of level of access people have. Fab, thank you. Um, one uh, that has been voted up, but I'm not. I think that we need to get to the bottom of the question: Is the MHHS LDM aligned with DCC and retail energy company? I think LDM might be lead delivery partner, which would make more sense. If it is. LDP, then yes, absolutely. Um, as I say, the, the, we have um, alongside the, the program party coordinator, so Marina and her colleagues, uh, we treat all participants uh, <laughs> with, with the same approach. So we view uh, DCC, Rec, Co, Project Helix, all as participants. They all need to come to the integration table. They all get the same assurance, support, everything else like that as, as individual suppliers networks. Um, so if we do engage uh, with, with and we're, we're deeply engaged with DCC at the moment on mod 162, um, uh, but DCC have been involved in this from the start. I was actually the DCC rep back in 2018 uh, on the half hourly program and the, the architect that I put in place is, is still representing uh, DCC in the in the discussions and, and attending DAG and all the working groups and things like that. So we're closely aligned with DCC and REC. Yeah, definitely. 
Thank you so much. And uh, like faster switching, does the programme see adapter services offering uh, playing a role to support suppliers and in interacting with the new DIP? Uh, yes. Yeah, again, um, we do not wish to fetter the discretion of suppliers or software providers or adapter providers in how they, they choose to approach the market. The, the, this, the supplier hub principle means the supplier is responsible for ensuring that the, the services are delivered as required by, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as long as you know those um, obligations are met, then the instruments that, that make up the tune are, you know, it's down to the individual suppliers and other, other participants as to how they achieve that. The, the TOM is effectively a guide to illustrate how the services could be configured, but it's not necessarily the case that everybody has to do it in the same way. Fab, thank you so much. And then uh, there's one final one, the play, the playback review and deep dive planning sessions in September does not have any deep dive sessions planned in the plan on a page. Um, it is earlier than the session. I think we do have the deep dive sessions plan in the plan on a page, so um, it might be just worth circulating that again, which we can do. Um, I think I think I think it's the case of yes, it, it's just me and this is mine. So the, there's the deep dive thing, the responsive deep dives, or if we're getting a call. Uh, as a result of any of the previous sessions say could we have a deep dive on i don't know dip key management then we will do our best to stand that up um, yeah. and it could be any point in september that we do that but we will take a bit of a review in that second week of september to say right what else do we need to do if we need to do any further deep dives bearing in mind that access to the smes might be a little tight yeah understood and and we've got one final question just around the logical data model and if we could have a deep dive uh, into the overall data model um, but we also have the design surgery drop-in sessions so um, if you wanted to ask more questions about the logical data model um, that would be a good chance to drop in and speak to SMEs around that subject. Yes absolutely I think the, 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 we uh, the logical data model is a collaboration between the design workstream and my team and so we need the data catalog in order to be able to produce a logical data model using the templates that we've already got for the, the enterprise architecture tool if that's not too much of a mouthful uh, and so we've given ourselves the period of August to get the LDM into a reasonable level of shape but we will be as transparent as possible with participants on our progress on that one and then um seeking you know their, their feedback but it will follow a fairly standard um uh, template that, that we've got from the the architecture tool uh, provider but amazing simon thank you so much for answering all these questions that's been um hugely helpful um and that's it for that's it for today so thank you so much right yeah thanks everybody Really appreciate it. We'll be um, yes. publishing the slides soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheerio.